Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to uh, Laws of Gunslingers with your host, Bang and Dang. And moving on after the wild and crazy Menendez brothers case. Yeah, Menendez where bros, those guys are nuts. The, the two giant losers over there. And, uh, <laughs> um, Ridiculous. Yeah, that uh, the whole case is crazy. The trial was just stupid. The dumbest possible prosecutors, the dumbest possible defense lawyers, the whole thing. And those... Go listen to it. All three parts, because... Especially the last part, because that shit was crazy. Those guys are weird. And the family was weird. Well, the yeah, mom the whole, and everybody. The whole, situation, the whole situation was kind of funky. Yeah, no wonder why uh, it was talk of the town or talk of the country, huh? Um, moving on, though, from a brutal murdering of parents to a brutal murder of a friend. Oh, by Well, not friend, but by uh, classmates and... Um, a lover scorn situation we got going on here right. between um, a group of four girls and a, who are between the ages of 15 and 17, and they ended up brutally murdering a 12-year-old. Oh, wow. Um, as you see, well, you Patreon people can see by the title that's sitting in front of us, Burned Alive, so you can imagine what's going to happen to this girl. Oh, um no. Speaking of Patreon, all you guys listening on the podcast mode, we're doing this right now on Patreon exclusively in video mode and also ad free and at least two days early before anybody else gets this on the podcast version. So if you guys are interested in video modes and you want no ads and early access, go to patreon.com forward slash bang dang. You get this show, Battles of the American Civil War, and this week in sports history, all for only two dollars a month. Both in video and audio mode, you can Can't plug even in buy your a grab bag of chips for two dollars anymore. Not no, that's for sure. Um, yeah, you get your own RSS feed if you guys just want to plug it into your podcast player like you're doing now. So um, that's something to think about. And also go subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bang Dang Network, where in addition to little clips and YouTube shorts we're posting over there, we got a whole new dart series um, going up right now. Right. By the time you, you guys, guys got a case you haven't heard yet. Put in the old comments. Or that, too. Um, by the time you guys hear this episode, though, we'll probably be six, seven, eight episodes into the dart season by now. Maybe 12. Um, Well, at least one's released. Right. Because right now we got three out. But this is four weeks in advance that we're recording this by the time you're hearing this. So, um, yeah, go give that a subscribe and uh, watch yeah. us. Well, watch me kick some ass in dart. So, wow. other than that. We'll get on with this case of the murder and slash torture of Shonda Scherer. Shonda was an American girl, obviously, tortured and burned to death. She was an American girl. She was burned to death in Madison, Indiana, by four teenage girls. Indiana sounds about right. The incident attracted international attention due to both the brutality of the murder and the young age of the perps, who I said already were between 15 and 17. The perps. The cake. The case was covered on national news and talk shows that has inspired a number of episodes on fictional crime shows. That's how big this case was. Not big in terms of that, but brutal and this called juicy stuff that uh, nobody has to write. Wow. It just writes itself, right? Right, yeah. Well, Shonda was born Pineville Community Hospital in Pineville, Kentucky, 6th of June, 1979. Stephen... And his wife, Jacqueline, who was later known as Jacqueline Vall. Oh, she must have got remarried. Um. Oh, yep. After her parents divorced, her mother remarried and the family moved to Louisville, leaving old daddy behind. There, Shonda attended fifth and sixth grades at St. Paul's School, where she was on the cheerleading, volleyball, and softball teams. Oh, look at that. That works out, right? Sure. When her mother divorced again, well, I don't think it's the guys. I don't think her mom's <laughs> yeah, got a problem. There's a common denominator here now. Right. Well, her mama divorced once again, and the family moved in June of 1991 to New Albany, Indiana. Shannon enrolled. Shonda. Shonda enrolled at Hazelwood Middle School. Earlier in the school year, she transferred to Our Lady Perpetual Help School. Okay. A Catholic school in New Albany where she joined the girls' basketball team. Oh, look at that. Uh, uh, I'd say a that's young where, little athlete, huh? Where the most bullying and all that happens is those Catholic private schools, man. 
or just private schools in general. Right. Um, li- Catholic. Meanwhile, we'll move on to the uh, perps, which is the main one here. Melinda Lovelace was born in uh, New Albany on uh, October 28, 1975. The youngest of three daughters to Marjorie, and she's got a pretty messed up life, which you see. And Larry Lovelace. Larry was drafted in the U.S. Army during Vietnam, and although horribly emotionally scarred, he was treated as a hero upon his return. Mm. Marjorie later described him as a sexual deviant who would wear her and her daughter's underwear and makeup and was incapable of staying monogamous. Oh, and had a mixture, Yeah. <laughs> and had a mixture of jealousy and fascination with seeing her have sex with other men and oh, women. Oh, no. They lived in or near New Albany throughout Melinda's childhood. Yeah, that's weird right there. You can almost bet there's some... Uh, already. Something messed them up in that war, huh? And plus, you can tell now there's already some type of uh, child play going on here, I bet. I mean, playing with childs. Right. Ooh. Larry worked irregularly for the Southern Railroad. Oh, geez. After his military service. His profession allowed him to work whenever most convenient for him. He's, mm, I'll go in for a couple hours today. Uh, Larry became a probationary officer with the New Albany Police Department, but was fired after eight months when his him and his partner assaulted an African-American man whom Larry accused of sleeping with his wife. Wait, and he was like, you didn't let me watch. Right. <laughs> He said no colors allowed. <laughs> well, that too, yeah. 1988, Larry briefly worked as a mail carrier, but quit after three months and did very little work, having brought most of his mail home to destroy it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's like, all right, whatever. This guy is just weird. Uh, Marjorie had worked intermittently since 1974. When both parents were working, the family was financially well off, living in the upper middle class suburb of Floyd's Knob, Indiana. Hey. Larry, who was violent and abusive, did not usually share his income with the family and impulsively spent money in, uh, he earned on himself, especially firearms, motorcycles, and cars. That's right. He filed for bankruptcy in 1980. Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. Extended family members often described a loveless marriage as loveless oh, and wow. the daughters as visiting their homes hungry, apparently not getting enough food at home. Oh, shit. Wow. Oh, yeah. Dad don't want to work. Right. Well, he, even when he has money, he's clearly not buying groceries and shit that the house needs. The loveless parents, uh, that's her name. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> they would often visit bars in Louisville when Larry would pretend to be a doctor or a dentist and introduce Marjorie as his girlfriend. Wow, they like to role play, you know, mm. I guess. You know. He would also share her with some of his friends from work, which he found disgusting. But did it. Right. During an orgy with another couple at their house, Marjorie tried to commit suicide. Oh, shit. An act she would repeat several times throughout her daughter's childhood. So she didn't like it. Well, obviously, clearly not. And he forced her. But dang, dude, that's fucked up. See, when you get marriages like this, it always affects the kids. Well, clearly. And it doesn't help back then. The, the wives had basically no say. I mean, look at all the, the sitcoms or the movies or everything back in the 60s. Straight to the moon, you know. Pow, pow, right in the kisser. And Got to stay at home, and you always see a mom with like a, a apron on or something. Right. Bacon putting a putting a pie on the windowsill, <laughs> or if somebody knocks on the door and she's not allowed to answer or even talk to anybody on the front porch or something. You know, you know how that shit goes. When Melinda was nine years old, Larry had Marjorie gang raped, after which she tried to drown herself. I mean, I why don't you try to drown him? Right. Jeez. After that incident, Marjorie refused him sex for a month. Until he raped her as their daughters overheard the event. She's like, you have me gang raped. I will refuse sex for a month. That'll make you. Right. That'll make it better. He's like, how about I just solo rape you? (laughs) Right. In summer of 1986, after she would not let him go home with two women he met at a bar, Larry beat Marjorie so severely that she was hospitalized. Wow. He was convicted of battery. Yeah, this Melinda chick's probably messed up, dude. The extent of Larry's abuse of his daughters and other children is unclear. Well, I think we just got it pretty clear. Well, if he's treating his wife like that, I guarantee he either didn't even pay attention to his kids or... Or paid attention to him a little bit too much. Right. As uh, various court testimonies claimed, he fondled Melinda as an infant. Molested oh, Marjorie. This Ma- guy's sick. Molested Marjorie's 13 year old sister early in the marriage and molested the girl's cousin Teddy from age 10 to 14. Oh, my, a guy? <laughs> I mean, they don't care. I Both know. older girls said he molested them, though Melinda did not admit this ever happened to her. She slept in bed with him until uh, he abandoned his family when she was 14. Really? Mm. In court, Teddy described an incident in which Larry tied all three sisters in a garage and raped them in succession. However, the sisters did not confirm account, this mm. account. Larry was verbally abusive to his daughters and fired a handgun in the direction of Melinda's older sister, Michelle, when she was seven, intentionally missing her. Holy shit. This what guy. What the hell is up with this dude? Dude, how badly 
Did he get messed up from the war? Or was why, he like this before? Are, are there no authorities that are... Do we got a before life? From him? Larry? Yeah. No. Kind of childhood he had? This sounds like one of these uh, mass murder guys. Right. Holy shit. Well, we're not doing a story about Larry now. <laughs> wow. All right. Jeez. He would also embarrass the children by finding their underwear and smelling it in front of the other family members. This is freaking And not one of those weird. family members... Right. Called anybody. I mean, geez. Oh, my goodness. Okay. For two years, beginning when Melinda was five, the family was deeply involved in the Graceland Baptist Church. Sure they were. Larry and Marjorie gave full confession and renounced drinking and swinging while they were members. Right, good for them. While they are members. Okay. Larry became a Baptist lay preacher. And Marjorie became the school nurse. Oh, look at her. A lay nurse. <laughs> <laughs> The church was later arranged for Melinda to be taken to a motel room with a 50-year-old man. It's not what you think. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was, <laughs> just keep on going, man. For a five-hour exorcism. Holy Baptist did exorcisms? I guess. I mean, right. Larry became a marriage. Okay. It's no no uh, story about that. Just, hey, man, she went to a five-hour exorcism. I guess so. Larry became a marriage counselor. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Wonder how many uh, marriages he messed up. Mm, well, he became a marriage counselor with the church and acquired a reputation for being too forward with women. Eventually attempted to rape one of them. Uh, next session, I need you to come along. <laughs> right. And <laughs> no clothes. Frank, don't ever come back. <laughs> After you're, the, You're not right for each other. Right. After the incident, the loveless parents left the church Assuming. and returned to their former professions and drinking. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, we tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we ain't cut off for this. It didn't work. Jeez. November 1990, after Larry was caught spying on Melinda and a friend, Marjorie attacked him with a knife. Oh, he shit. was sent to the hospital after he attempted to grab it. Oh. She then attempted suicide again, and her daughters caught authorities. Oh, my. After this incident, Larry filed for divorce and moved to Avon Park, Florida. He filed for divorce? I guess so. Melinda felt crushed, especially when Larry remarried. He, he oh, sent no. He sent letters to her for a while, playing on her emotions, but eventually severed all contact with her. And in December 1998, he died. Oh. Uh, I think it's going to be mentioned later on in episode. Not, oh, tragically. Um, He actually got brought to court for... Oh, yeah? His molestation shit. Oh, so. shit. Clearly, nothing happened to him. Right. He died, though. Right. Well, that's good enough. <laughs> right. Well, the next girl, part of this tragedy, Mary Lorreen, or this plain old Lori Tackett. Why would they call her Lori and not Mary? She didn't like Mary. She just called me Lori. I don't know, man. I didn't know the girl. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> Mary Lorreen Tackett was born in Madison, Indiana, October 5th, 1974. Her mother was a fundamentalist a Pentecostal Christian, and her father was a factory worker with two, count them, two felony, convictions felony convictions in the 60s. Wow. Tackett claimed that she was molested at least twice as a child at ages 5 and 12. By who? Right. In May 1989, her mother discovered that Tackett was changing from a dress into jeans at school, and after a confrontation that night, attempted to strangle her. Usually be the other way around, you know, the kids go to school with jeans on and then want to yeah, change into like a skimpy like a, dress or something, yeah. but she's doing the opposite and she's like, no, oh, wow, oh, strangle her ass, huh? Social workers became involved. Finally, what about the other people? All right. And Tackett's parents agreed to unannounced visits to ensure that child abuse was not occurring. I don't think they had a, uh, they didn't agree. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they had a choice. <laughs> there, you don't agree? Okay. Okay. We'll do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or we'll just take them. Right. Taggett and her mother came into periodic conflict. At one point, her mother went to Hope Rippy's house, which we'll learn about in a couple seconds, after learning that Rippy's father had purchased an Ouija board for the girls. Oh, wow. She demanded that the board be burnt and that Rippy house be exercised. <laughs> Taggett became increasingly rebellious after her 15th birthday and also became fascinated with the occult. She would often attempt to impress her friends by pretending to be possessed by the spirit of Deanna the Vampire. Oh, shit. Tackett began to engage in self-harm, especially after early 1991 when she began gaining a, dirt, a girl who was involved in the practice of self-harm or of the occult. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably both. Was uh, bad, uh, bad Boys was, uh, Lost Boys out yet? Of course, 80s. Yeah, maybe. Was her name Deanna? I don't think so. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I don't think so, though. Badass if it was. Who's her? The girl in uh, Lost Boys. With the kid? Oh, uh, I don't think her name was Deanna. 
Her parents discovered self-mutilation and checked her into a hospital on 19th of March, 1991. She was prescribed an antidepressant and released. That's oh, that's even, probably what you don't want to do. Yeah, it's even worse. Like, hey, what's your side effect of this antidepressant? You everything. may get suicidal thoughts. <laughs> and everything else. Right. Two days later, with a girlfriend and Tony Lawrence. Her Tony Lawrence is. Another one of the perps. <laughs> Tech had cut her wrist deeply and was returned to the hospital. And her friends just allow, allow this. No, well, sure, they didn't give a shit. After treatment of her wound, she was admitted to the hospital psychiatric ward. Yeah, you think? Tech was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Confessed that she had experienced hallucinations since she was young. She was discharged on the twelfth of April. Just a month later. I mean, come on, you just don't get better then. She dropped out of high school in uh, September nineteen ninety one. Mm. Well, she then stayed in. See, that's a problem, man. <laughs> they didn't take too much seriousness, and and with these damn idiot kids, you're cutting yourself. You, you are you're in the hospital twice in one week. What are they supposed to do? Clearly, she wasn't right. Well, let's just release her. I mean, she was a, a minor. It's probably up to the parent, right? Well, then the parents are idiots for not leaving, leaving her there. Well, we already seen. Oh, well, right. Well, Tackett then stayed in Louisville in October 91 to live with various friends. There, she met Loveless. The two became friends in late November. In December, she moved back to Madison on the promise that her father would buy her a car. She still spent most of her time in Louisville and New Albany, and by December spent most of it with Loveless. All right. So, girl number two, almost as equally of a messed up life so far. Right, and now she's friends with, what's her face? Mm-hmm. Hope. Anna Rippey was born in Madison on the 9th of June, 1976. Her father, an engineer at power plant. Her parents divorced in February 1984. She moved with her mother and siblings to Quincy, Michigan. Hey. For three years, she stayed there. She claimed that living with her family in Michigan was somewhat turbulent. Her parents resumed their relationship in Madison in 1987. She was then reunited with friends Tackett and Tony Lawrence. Whom she had known since childhood. She's like, I'm back. Guess who's back? <laughs> Although her parents saw Tackett as a bad influence. Yeah, so. I would so. Yeah, yeah. All right. As with the other girls, Rippy began to self harm at age 52. It's like a. It's like a group of self harmers. <sighs> I guess that's all we know about uh, Hope. Let's move on to Tori Lawrence. Tony Lawrence, who was the last culprit here. Uh, she was born in Madison, February 14th, 1976. Her father was a boiler maker. She was close friends with Rippy from childhood. She was abused by a relative at age nine and was raped by a teenage boy at age 14. Mm-hmm. Although the police only issued an order for the boy to keep away from Lawrence. Huh. She went into counseling after the incident, but did not follow through. She became promiscuous, began to self-harm, and attempted suicide in eighth grade. 1990, 14-year-old Loveless began dating another young girl named Amanda Heverin. After Loveless's father left the family and her mother remarried. Loveless behaved erratically after the remarriage. She got into fights at school and reported being depressed, resulting in her receiving professional counseling. March 1991, Loveless came out as a lesbian to her mother, uh, who was initially furious, but eventually she was like, well, what am I going to do? Right. I guess. She's like, I've ate a couple of vaginas as well. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, at least she won't come home pregnant. Well, maybe. Well, maybe. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Depends on what a girl is. <laughs> right. Back then. As the year progressed, Loveless's relationship with Heverin deteriorated. I mean, come on. Two women in a, in a relationship with each other. Right. Can't see it less than more than a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> Heverin met Shonda earlier in the fall semester at Hazelwood Junior High School when they became when they got into a fight. Oh shit. However, they became friends while in detention for that altercation and later exchanged romantic letters. Oh. Loveless immediately grew jealous of Heverin and Cher's relationship. Early 1991 of October, Heverin, early October 1991, Heverin and Cher attended a school dance where Loveless found and confronted them. Although Heverin and Loveless had never formally ended the relationship, Loveless started to date an older girl. Okay. After Heverin and uh, Cher attended a festival together in late October, Loveless began to discuss killing Shonda and threatened her in public. Concerned about the effects of their daughter's relationship with Heverin, Cher's parents arranged for her to transfer to a Catholic school in late November. Heverin states that she gave letters Loveless sent her containing death threats towards Cher to a youth prosecutor, quote-unquote, but the youth prosecutor never did anything about it as far as she knew. Really? All right. Hmm. Night of 10th of January, 1992, 
Lawrence was 15, Rippy is 15, Tackett is 17, drove Tackett's car from Madison to Loveless's house in New Albany. Rippy and Lawrence, while both friends of Tackett, had not previously met Loveless, who was 16 years old. Upon arrival, they browsed some clothes from Loveless. <laughs> I've never seen you two for here. I mean, they're girls. Right. Upon arrival, they borrowed some clothes from Loveless, and she showed them a knife, telling them she was going to scare Shonda with it. While Tackett, Rippy, and Lawrence had never met Shonda prior to that night, Tackett had already known of the plan to intimidate the 12-year-old girl. Of course. Loveless, She's 12. Right? Right Loveless explained to the other girls that she dislikes Shonda for being a copycat and for stealing her girlfriend. Wow. wow. Was, <clears throat> these guys are 16, 17, and <laughs> yeah. you know, what, the 12-year-old? Uh, yes. Wow. Uh, Tackett let Rippy drive the four girls to Jeffersonville, where Cher stayed with her father on the weekend, stopping at a McDonald's restaurant to ask for directions. They arrived at Shonda's house shortly before dark. Loveless instructed Rippy and Lawrence to go to the door and introduce themselves as friends of Hevron, then uh, invite Shonda to come with them to see Hevron, who was waiting for them at the Witch's Castle, or uh, Mistletoe Falls, which is a ruined stone house located on an isolated hill overlooking the Ohio River. Jeez, when the hell would you do that? Why would she go with them, anyways? Like, that's straight out of a freaking uh, vampire movie. I mean, I understand it's like the early 90s, but wouldn't you think Hevron would have called her and be like, hey, my two friends are coming over, they're going to drive you to where I am. Well, Shonda said she cannot go right now because her parents were awake, and she told the girls to come back around midnight. Uh, Loveless was angry at first, but Rippy and Lawrence assured her about returning. The four girls crossed the river to Louisville and attended a punk rock show by the band Sunspring uh -huh. at the Autobahn Skate Park near Interstate 65. All right. Lawrence and Rippy quickly lost interest in the music and went to the parking lot outside where they engaged in sexual activities with two boys in Tackett's car. Of course they did. <laughs> Right. Eventually, the four girls left Shonda's house. Left for Shonda's house. During the ride, Loveless said that she could not wait to kill Shonda. Whoa, now we're killing? All right. However, Loveless also said she just intended to use the knife to frighten her. Jeez. What are you going to do, bud? When they arrived at Shonda's house at 1230 a.m., Lawrence refused to retrieve Shonda. So Tack and Rippy went to the door. Loveless hit under a blanket in the back seat of the car with the knife. Oh, jeez. Well... Rippy told Shanda that Heverin was still at the witch's castle, which I guess this chick is only 12, so easy to manipulate, but right. it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, Shanda was reluctant to go with him, yet agreed after changing her clothes. After they got in the car, Rippy began questioning Cher about the relationships with Heaven. Heverin. Loveless then sprang out from the back seat, put the knife to Cher's neck, and began interrogating her about her sexual relationship with Heverin. Hmm. They drove towards Utica and the witch's castle. Tackett told the girls that a local legend um, said the house was once owned by nine witches and that the townspeople burned down the house to get rid of the witches. Really? Hmm. Uh, Want to look at that? At the witch's castle, they took a sobbing Shonda inside and bound her arms and legs with rope. There, Loveless taunted that she had pretty hair and wondered how much pretty she would look if they were to cut it all off. How pretty would you be now? Which frightened Shonda even more. She's like, no, not my hair. Right. Loveless began taking off Shannon's rings, Shanda's rings, and handed each to the girls. At some point, Rippy had taken Shanda's Mickey Mouse watch and danced to the tune it played. What was the tune? Probably, in 1985. Was it the one where he's standing there and his hands are going around? I'm sure it was. Right, that's the only one, right? I guess. This tells you uh, her age and mindset. She's got a Mickey Mouse watch. Right. Tag Although, it. I guess right, there. adults cool. did wear Mickey Mouse back in the day. Right. Taggett further taunted Shonda, claiming that the witch's castle was filled with human remains, and Shonda's would be next. Oh, damn. To further threaten Shonda, Taggett then retrieved a shirt with a smiley design from the car and lit it on fire. Oh, the smile face? I'm assuming, right? Right. But immediately feared that the fire would be spotted by passing cars, so the girls left with Shonda. Oh, yeah, we gotta get out of here. Right. Um, during the car ride, Shonda continued begging them to take her back home. Well, Loveless ordered Shonda to slip off her bra, which she then handed over to Rippy, who slid off her own bra and replaced it with Shonda's while steering the car. <laughs> Jeez. Well, they, came lo they became lost, so they stopped at a gas station and covered Shonda with a blanket. Oh, my. While Tackett went inside to ask for directions, Lawrence called a boy she knew in Louisville and chatted for several minutes to ease her worries, but did not mention Shonda's abduction. Of course not. Uh, they returned to the car, became, but became lost again and pulled up to another gas station. Women, am I right? <laughs> 
There, Lawrence and Rippy spotted a couple of boys and talked to them before once again getting back into the car and leaving, arriving sometime later at the edge of some woods near Tackett's home in Madison. Wow. Uh-uh-uh. What the hell are these kids doing, man? Tackett led them to a dark abandoned building off a logging road in a densely forested area. Lawrence and Rippy were frightened and stayed in the car. They're like, I'm not getting out of this damn car. We should stop. This is supposed to be a joke, damn it. I think they were more frightened of the woods, not the uh, what was going on here, as you'll see. <laughs> Loveless and Tackett made Shanda strip down to her underwear. Then Loveless beat Shanda with her fist. Next, Loveless repeatedly slammed Shanda's face into her knee, which cut Shanda's mouth on, on her braces. Oh, no. Loveless tried to slash Shanda's throat, but the knife was too dull. Ah, dude, it probably hurt like hell. Rippy then came out of the car to hold down Shanda. Loveless and Tackett took turns stabbing Shanda in the chest. They then strangled her with a rope until she was unconscious, placing her in the trunk of the car and told the other two that Shanda was dead. Hmm. Well, they then drove to Tackett's nearby home and went inside to drink soda and clean themselves. Drink straight, soda. straight out of um, Goodfellas. <laughs> Literally. Right. Uh, hey, Ma, can I borrow this? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, when they heard Shanda screaming in the trunk, Tackett went out with a paring knife and stabbed her several more times. Oh, jeez. Coming back a few minutes later covered with blood. After she washed, Tackett told the girl's futures with her rune stones. Well, they're just chilling. 2.30 a.m., Lawrence and Rippy stayed behind as Tackett and Lovis went country cruising, driving to the nearby town of Cannon, or Canaan. Sharer continued to make crying and gurgling noises, so Tackett stopped the car. Oh my goodness, these girls are messed up. They've got to be on some type of drugs. <sighs> so I stopped the car, opened up the trunk. Shonda sat up, covered in blood with her eyes rolled back in her head, but unable to speak. Tackett beat her with a tire iron until she was silent. Jeez. Claiming that she felt the victim's head caving in and then told Loveless to smell it. Wow. There were also reports of the victim being sexually assaulted with the same weapon. Oh, jeez. I don't know about that. Is that in the... Oh, that's true. This tire iron assault was off and on for hours as the girls went on joyriding through the countryside. Jeez. Well, then Loveless and Tackett returned to Tackett's house just before daybreak to clean up again. Rippy asked about Shonda, and Tackett laughingly described the torture. The conversation woke up Tackett's mother, who yelled at her daughter for being out late and bringing home the girls, so Tackett agreed to take them home. She drove to a burn pile where they opened the trunk to stare at Shonda. Lawrence refused to look. Rippy sprayed Shara with Windex and taunted, You're not so hot looking now, are you? Mm. What the hell's Windex got to do with anything but whatever? Ridiculous. <sighs> they then drove down to the gas station near Madison Consolidated High School. Pumped some gas into the car, bought a two-liter bottle of Pepsi, and drove on the way. Tack it poured up Pepsi and refilled the bottle with gasoline. <laughs> well, so they didn't drive out. <laughs> they had to drive away and then they had to turn her back around. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so Tack it poured out the Pepsi and refilled the bottle with gasoline. Anyway, they drove past Jefferson Proving Ground to Lemon Road off of US Route 421, a place known to Rippy. Lawrence remained in the car while Tack and Rippy wrapped Shonda, who was still alive. How? She was fighting. So, yeah, they wrapped her in a blanket and carried her to a field by the gravel country road. Tackett made Ripley pour the gasoline on Shonda, and then they set her on fire. Wow. Loveless was not convinced Shonda was dead, so they returned a few minutes later to pour the rest of the gasoline on her. <clears throat> Dude, these girls are some funky funk. What the hell is this? How have I never heard of this? Mm, I yeah. probably have. You have now. Well, the girls went to a McDonald's restaurant at 9.30 a.m. for breakfast, where they laughed about Shanda's body looking like one of the sausages they were eating. Oh, my. Lawrence then phoned a friend and told her about the murder. Tackett then dropped off Lawrence and Rippy at their homes and finally returned to her own home with Loveless. She told Heverin that they had killed Shanda and arranged to pick up Heverin later that day. Friend of Loveless, Crystal Wathen, came over to Loveless's house and they, they told her what happened. Then the three girls drove to pick up Heverin and take her back to Loveless's home, where they told Heverin the story. What the hell? Well, both Heverin and Wathen were reluctant to believe the story until Hackett showed them the trunk of the car. Why is this Heverin chick going with them anyways when she had been right fighting with Loveless and stuff? I mean, uh, this doesn't make any sense. 
Wow. So they show the trunk of the car to see Shonda's bloody handprints and socks still present. Heverin was horrified and asked to be taken home. When they pulled up to the front of her house, Loveless kissed Heverin, told her she loved her, and pleaded with her not to tell anyone. Well, Heverin promised that she would not before entering her house. Well, later on the morning of July 11th, 1992... Two brothers from Canaan or Cannon were driving towards Jefferson Proving Ground to go hunting when they noticed a body on the side of the road. They initially thought it was a mannequin of some sort, but upon exiting the vehicle, realized it was clearly the body the body of a burned child. Oh, my. Uh, they called the police at 10.55 a.m. and were asked to return to the corpse. Obviously, to wait for the troopers, who right. were David Cam and Jefferson County Sheriff Buck Shipley, and detectives begin an investigation collecting forensic evidence at the scene. My goodness, dude. That's just ridiculous. These... How are these... I don't understand. These chicks are just like... Well, I guess when you're uh, involved in some dark occult shit, you don't give a shit. What was that movie? Heathers or something like that? Yeah. And then, uh... Just crazy, man. Teenage girls can be pricks, especially lesbians. Holy shit. M- <laughs> mad lesbians. It's been sexually assaulted and abused all their... Oh. And you got four of them against one little confused 12-year-old. Well, the cops initially suspected a drug deal gone wrong, did not believe the crime had been committed by locals. It was also to be noted that her body was posed in a suggestive position, very obviously meaning that she was done on purpose with intention. It was also found out that the victim's face and hands were burnt in an attempt to keep her unrecognizable and unidentifiable. Shonda's father, Stephen, noticed his daughter was nowhere to be found on the 11th of January. After phoning neighbors and friends all morning, he, he called his former wife, Shonda's mother, at 1.45 p.m. They met and filed a missing persons report with the Clark County Sheriff. Well, 8.20 p.m. that oh, same. She was living with her dad? Well, she was there for the weekend. Mm. That's right. Um, 8.20 p.m. that same day, hysterical, uh, a hysterical Lawrence and Rippy went to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office with their parents. They both gave very rambling statements, identifying the victim as Shonda, um, naming the two other girls involved as best they could and describing the main events of the previous night. After an inter-county investigation, Shipley contacted the Clark County Sheriff and was finally able to match the body to Shonda's missing person report. Mm. Detectives obtained dental records that positively identified Shonda as the victim. Loveless and Tacklett were, were arrested on the 12th of January, the very next day. The bulk of the evidence for the arrest warrant came from the statements made by Lawrence and Rippy. Whose car whose car were they in? Tackett's? Yeah, mm-hmm. Tackett's. The prosecution immediately declared, declared its intention to try both Loveless and Tackett as adults. For several months, prosecutors and defense attorneys did not release any info about this case, given the news media only statements by uh, Lawrence and Rippy. All four girls were charged as adults. All four, okay. To avoid the death penalty, the girls accepted plea bargains. Yeah, but they did. All four girls had trouble backgrounds, which we've explored already. Hmm. Um, Lawrence, Rippy, and Tackett all had histories of self-harming behavior. Tackett was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and suffering from hallucinations. Right. Loveless, often described as the ringleader in the attack, had the most extensive history of abuse and mental health issues, which we've seen. And this will all play a role in their little court stuff. We don't get a um, detailed trial with this one. That's probably not too much. Yeah, well, we had enough details, I think. <laughs> right. Man, that's just, that's the most gruesome one I've seen yet. Yeah, that's pretty uh, crazy. I mean, we've seen oh, near decapitations shit. from OJ and all that type of shit. Dr. Menendez, bros. This is going to be probably the most brutal wow. murder that we've covered, for sure. Not only the fact they attacked her with a dull knife, couldn't cut her throat, which was severely probably bruised and hurt like hell after that. Stabbed her how many times? Multiple. Took turns, supposedly. Then threw her in a trunk. And then, when she was still alive, a paring knife, which is sharp as hell. It's almost like a scalpel. How many times with the paring knife? And then they think she's dead again. Then, in a trunk, driving down the road, she's still doing it. So, they get out and beat her in the face with the tire iron for an hour and a half. Well, not only before that, before they actually stabbed her, they beat the shit out of her physically with right. fists and knees and shit. I mean, that's torture. Clearly. <laughs> and this went on for hours, wasn't it? At least Almost, no, from like hours. midnight to five in the morning or something. Right. Oh, my freaking goodness. Tack and Loveless were sentenced to 60 years in the Indiana women's prison. prison. You got to realize, too, these guys are all underage. So. Right. Uh, Tack and Loveless. But they were tried as adults. Right. 
They're sentenced to 60 years in the Indiana women's prison in Indianapolis. Rippey was sentenced to 60 years with 10 years suspended for mitigating the circumstances. Friday for coming up. Plus 10 years of medium supervision probation. She never going to know, though. On appeal, a judge reduced the sentence to 35 years. In exchange for cooperation, Lawrence was allowed to plead guilty to one count of criminal confinement and was sentenced to a maximum of 20 years. Maximum, she's probably already out. She's the, I'm, she's the only one that actually didn't participate in any... Right, but she was there. ...doing anything, right? Right, but the other one, the Rippy, didn't she actually do something? She's the one that poured the gas on him. Right. ...on her, and then, uh, well, she set the... Or she held her down while she was getting stabbed, too, so... <sighs> but that tacket and Loveless, oh, my, mm-hmm. my, my, my. October 2007 now, Loveless's attorney, Mark Small, requested a hearing to argue for his client's release. Why? He said that Loveless had been profoundly retarded... Get out of here. This is his words, by childhood abuse. Right. Moreover, she had not been represented competently by counsel during her sentencing, which caused her to accept a plea bargain in the face of exaggerated claims about her chances of receiving the death penalty. I mean, clearly she's not right in the head if she thinks she's like a witch or something. That was the other one. Loveless. No, that was Tackett. Oh. Um, I don't know about all these. (laughs) Small also argued that Loveless, who was 16-year-olds when she signed the plea agreement, was too young to enter into a contract with the state without a consent from a parent or guardian. That's probably she tried as an adult. But still, she still need to be. You still have rights as underage, though. No, you know, once you do something like that, you have no rights. I think so. Hell if the judge accepted these arguments, Loveless could have been retried or released outright. But not happening. January eight, two thousand eight. Loveless's request was rejected by Jefferson Circuit Judge Ted Todd. He's like, I don't think so. Instead, Loveless would be eligible for parole in fifteen years. F- that no. She was already eligible in 15 years. Yeah, they ain't going to let her out. Thus, maintains an original guilty plea. 14th November, 2008, Lovelace's appeal was denied by the Indiana Court of Appeals, upholding Judge Todd's ruling. Small stated that he would seek to have jurisdiction over the case, move to Indiana Supreme Court, like we're going up, up and up and up. Well, Lawrence... Meanwhile, was released from prison December 14, 2000. She did. After serving nine years. Nine years. She remained on parole until December of 2002. Um, Rippy was released April 28, 2006 on parole after serving 14 years, and she remained on supervised parole for five years until April 2011. Are you serious? Yep. Tackett, oh no, Tackett was released from Rockville Correctional Facility on January 11, 2018, the 26th anniversary. She only did 26 years. Mm-hmm. Get out of here. That's life. And then she completed an additional per year parole. Additional year, that's it. That's a one year. It should be like a life. Lifetime, right? Get the fuck out of here. Loveless was released from Indiana. I mean, no, get out of here. <laughs> Loveless was released from Indiana Women's Prison. I re- she was released? Mm-hmm. What is going in? I told you, Indiana's freaking weird, man. She was released in September 5th, 2019, after serving 26 plus years, so 27 years. And she will serve parole in Jefferson County in Kentucky. Well, okay. And I'm sure that's probably already done. Probably to um, during Loveless's sentence and hearing. Um, I, no. There's no way that all these, maybe one, the first one, Lawrence, are right. walking. There's, I don't even care. Well, even the Rippy, she's thought she jumped. She was, gonna, yeah, but they said that Taggett forced her to. So, mm, okay. um, this brings us back to old Larry. We think we forgot about him during Lovelace's sentence in Heron. Extensive open court testimony revealed that he had abused his wife, daughters, and other children. Consequently, he was arrested in February of '93 on charges of rape, sodomy, and sexual battery. Oh, shit. Most of the crimes occurred from '68 to '77. Larry remained in prison for over two years, awaiting trial. However, a judge eventually ruled that all charges except one which was the count of sexual battery, had to be dropped due to statute of limitations. Yeah, I mean, it was, what, 15 years later? Well, which was five years in Indiana. Loveless pleaded guilty to the one count of sexual battery. Larry received a sentence of time served, released in June 1995. Hmm. Well, it's still technically two years. A few weeks following his release, Larry unsuccessfully sued the Floyd County Jail for $39 million in federal court, alleging he had suffered cruel and unusual punishment during his two-year incarceration. I bet he did. I'm sure. Man, I'm sure by maybe some uh, turnkeys, but mostly by the prisoners. Which the turnkeys allowed. Right. Among his complaints, <laughs> <laughs> among his complaints were that he was not allowed to sleep in his bed during the day, 
or to read the newspaper. Oh, you can't sleep during the day? <laughs> oh, too fucking bad. Right. Shonda's father, Stephen, died of alcoholism in 2005. I can wonder why. He was only 53 years old. Man, I would probably too. All right. An interview with Shonda's mother, Jacques. No, it's Jacqueline. 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 Right. right. Jacqueline. On the Investigation Discovery series, Deadly Women, which I haven't... Is, there, is that a thing? Of course. Vaught stated that Shonda's father was so destroyed by his daughter's murder that he did everything he could to kill himself besides put a gun to his freaking head and that he drank himself to death. And at 53 years old, he must drink pretty hard. You're talking... Uh, well, obviously, time he got up, the time he got to bed. Uh, everybody says that this poor guy died of a broken heart. Sure he did. I'm, I don't see how the mom did it. Well, meanwhile, the Shonda Sharer Scholarship Fund was established in January 2009. It planned to provide scholarships to two students per year from Prosser School of Technology in New Albany. One scholarship to a student who was continuing his or her education, and the other to a student who's beginning his or her career and must buy tools or other work equipment. Why did it take 20 years? Well, not almost 20 years, but... Ridiculous. By November 2018, Shonda's mother, Jock Voigt Vaught, said that the scholarship fund had been depleted and is no longer accepting donations. Hmm. 220 or 2012, she made her first contact with Melinda Loveless since the trials, although indirectly. Vaught donated a dog named Angel in Shonda's name to Loveless to train for the Indiana Canine Assistance Network program through Project to Heal, which provides service pets to people with disabilities, which obviously uh, prisoners train. Hmm. Loveless trained dogs for the program for several years. Vault reported that she had endured criticism over the decision, but defends it, saying, It's my choice to make. Shonda's my child. If you don't let good things come from bad things, nothing gets better. And I know what my child would want. My child would want this. Good for you, lady. Right. Good for you. She also stated that she hoped to donate a dog every year in honor of Shonda's share. My daughter, my sweet little girl. In documentary produced by Episode 11 uh, Productions titled Charlie Scars, captured Vaught's decision to allow Loveless to train dogs in Shonda's name. The film also has three interviews with Loveless. Mm, really? Good for that. Also, uh, oh, I bet. Oh, I had my time and I feel so I'm, you know, I'm right. And she don't, deserve, I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing everything for her. Mm, doubt it. I don't know. You see it. Um, yeah, and there's also TV shows, documentaries, um, little investigation, discovery, and court TV. Oh, you've never all this stuff. This. Um, Law and Order SVU, I think, did a um, version of it on their show and all this shit. So it's been all over the place, man. It's crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. man. That's some sick stuff. None, I don't see how. And it's not like they were. 12, 13, like Shauna, they're 16, 17. Well old enough. Okay. But why? I know that every one of those children that killed my child had somewhat of a, a horrible childhood. Jackie Vaught's daughter, Shanda, was kidnapped and murdered in 1992 by four teenage girls. Court testimony showed some of the girls had been abused by their parents. Vaught thinks abuse and neglect factor into many cases. Most of them had had some form of, of abuse. And I, I know that that's the reason why these children could kill. It's not an excuse at all, but it is a reason. I asked myself why, and I don't have the answer. Melinda Loveless was one of Shanda's teenage killers. She and the three other girls held Shanda in the trunk of a car, stabbed and bludgeoned her, then burned her alive. Even she doesn't fully understand her crime, but she knows she was hurting from a childhood filled with abuse. It turns into anger if you keep that hurt and don't let it go or don't forgive that person or don't forgive yourself. She that hurt her. can turn into anger and hate. Looks like who? And um, make you do things that, that you would model herself never after. really do. <laughs> Melinda's hurt resulted from years of physical and emotional abuse by her father. She admits he sexually abused her as well from a very young age, but she still can't quite cope with it. Evidently, I'm, I'm not all the way healed. Um, I deny it too, in a way. I mean, I'm not calling. All right, bitch. I'm done with She's you. She's still nuts. She's still nuts. I'm done with you. Screw that. She got a she got a good uh, face, acting face on. Right. She did everything she needed to do to get out. She was smart. Screw that. 
all but one of them should have stayed. Maybe the Rippy one should have got out. But I guess she did, what, 16 years or something? Nine years? 12. 12 years? So like, 14. The other two did 26, so. So, that's not enough. Well, the life sentence is only 25, but <clears throat> That's ridiculous. And they didn't even get life. They got 60 years, so clearly they were going to get out um, in a third of that time. That's usually what happens, so. Screw that. So they were what, twenty six years? Went in at age sixteen, seventeen, twenty seven, thirty seven. Dude, there's like forty. Still got a whole life ahead of them. All right, that's bullshit. That gruesome of a crime, you never get out. I don't care. Yeah, that was a pretty crazy crime, and um, and like it didn't happen in within like two minutes. It happened within hours. Repeated stuff. That's there's like, that's like serial killing the same person. They were a serial killer for the same person. Crazy. I don't know how, because they're women. What? That's why. They didn't get, they're out of jail. Mm. Well, there's plenty of examples Examples of it's very possible. Um, men killing people when they're younger and they're, out, they're out of jail 20, 30 years later. So Not beating and bludgeoning and then setting on fire. No. No. Well, they had shitty childhoods, man. It's not an excuse. Well, apparently it was. It's, um, parole board thought it was well that'll do it for us and one of the most messed up um that's sad gruesome uh murders we've covered so far and mind you we've done wild west and um <sighs> prohibition people like al capone and shit and mm. these guys didn't even murder as, <laughs> as viciously as right. uh these chicks did so wow yeah reminder just recorded this whole episode on video at patreon.com forward slash bang dang if you guys like video plus ad free and um, get this episode at least two days early, sign up there for $2 a month. Plus you get this week in sports history and battles of the American Civil War all on video, all early, all ad free, as well as go to YouTube.com where we do um, a little dart league over there. Getting it. Um, yeah. Play 162 games. First 82 wins is the champion. And right now, yours truly is, of course, whooping ass because it's uh, what I do. It's what I do, what you'll see if you uh, like, tune in by this. You're maybe up at like two games. Well, kicking ass, taking names, if buddy. So go uh, Bang Dang Network over there on YouTube and give us a subscription member as well. Go to Spotify and Apple and leave a review, like, review, all that good stuff. And we'll see you next week for. We got one more episode. We'll probably do. Well, it'll be a murder of some sort, um, and then um, the week after that. Which, Have we done a show with no? Yeah, we've done a couple with no waiters. Mm, yeah, Wild West ones, right. <laughs> literally. Um, yeah, two weeks, one day before the, well, the week of the um, burning of the American Fire. Branch Davidian um, little compound. We will have the oh. Waco episode for you guys too. So that's our next right. couple of weeks coming up on Outlaws and Gunslingers. And what is it, the second or third biggest massacre in uh, U.S. history? Hmm. Seventy-six people or something like that. Sure, yeah, wasn't it? <clears throat> and like twenty-five women and children. Ridiculous. So sad. Yeah. And people cheered it too when it happened. Well, I'm like those damn bastards. Screw them. Well, yeah, they did. Well, we'll they get to that. Did. That'll be the next couple of weeks coming up on Outlaws and Gunslingers. We'll see you then. We're the Month of Michiganders. Bang, dang.